Hello， 接下来是我们的 Prime Session， 大家可以留下来听听看。Hi， welcome to the Prime Session. The next talk will be given by Paloma Oliveira. And the topic is the yin and yang of open source, unveiling the dynamics of collaboration, diversity, and cultural transformation. 欢迎来到 Prime Session。接下来的演讲者是 Paloma Oliveira， 主题是开源的阴阳，探讨合作、多样性和文化转型间的动态变化。Paloma is an open source de developer at Source Labs and have been promoting free and open source culture since 2009. She co-organized Pilates Berlin, mentored at Frau and Loop, and co-founded a Net Art Institute in Berlin. Paloma is Source Lab 的 open source 开发者，自两千零九年以来一直推广自由和开源文化。她是 Pilates Berlin 的共同组织者，在 Frau and Loop 担任导师，并在柏林共同创办了一个网络艺术机构。We are happy to invite Paloma through OSI, the open source initiative, which is a leading voice on the policies and principles of open source, and now celebrating their 25th anniversary. Don't forget to get their anniversary sticker at the entrance. 我们很高兴透过 OSI, the open source initiative, 邀请到 Paloma. OSI 是在世界上领导 open source 政策和准则的组织，而今年是他们的二十五周年。别忘了在入口处领取 OSI 的纪念贴纸。After the talk, there is a QA session, and you can scan the slide link at the QR code here to enter your question. 在呃我们的演讲结束后会有一个 QA 时间，那可以扫描这个 slide link 去填入你的 question。那我们欢迎 Paloma。So I will use the most Taiwanese I know, which is、uh, Li Hou. <laughs>、uh, Thank you so much for receiving me. My name is Paulo Oliveira, and what I, when I was invited to come here and talk to you, and this is my first time ever in Asia, it is、uh, quite of a challenge. So what I choose to do is to take you through a journey、um, from telling you a little narrative of a personal story, but that shows a little bit of the open source story. Um, I was invited by the Open Source Initiative to represent or to tell a little bit about the 25 years that the foundation is celebrating this year, and that tells a lot of what happening through those years and how much the scenery in what we call open source home generally means. And so this is what I'm about to tell you in the next 30 minutes.、Um, in the middle. I will ask you a few questions, and I would appreciate if you could raise your hand or your feet or whatever you feel like comfortable, just to tell me yes or no、uh, when I ask you something. <laughs> just because I'm really eager to understand how is the Asian and the Taiwanese open source、uh, scene. And、um, so this is me.、Um, I will tell a little bit of my narrative、uh, as a little kind of storytelling story. Uh, but currently, I am an open source developer advocate. That means that I think about open source、uh, for work, full time. Besides of doing a lot of voluntary work、uh, for a long, long time,、uh, nowadays mostly for Pi Ladies Berlin, which is an organization specialized or focused in having more diversity in open source in Berlin, focused on Python communities. And I work for a company called Source Labs,、uh, which is built on top of an open source project called Selenium. And this is why I'm there, because we need to give it back to our communities. I want to thank you a lot to, of course, the Open Source Initiative who invited me, but also to the Open Culture Foundation who made it possible for me to come.、Uh, this presentation, by the way, is.、Uh, Has a Creative Commons license and is shareable, and I will give you the QR code to download it. So all the links and all the references I quote or I mention, it is available in the presentation. And this is how, <laughs> starting from the beginning, I was presented to open source.、Oh. 
now I understand his struggle with the... Um, I believe there's no audio. Um, this was my first introduction to open source. It was in a convention that I helped organize in Sao Paulo, where I come from in Brazil. And it was a, <laughs> a con that was the first time I got in contact with this community and um, this idea of uh, collaborative culture. Uh, this was in a convention that I helped to organize. And I got there like a good resident telenovela story uh, because I had a crush in someone, a crush, which didn't stay longer, but my love for the community persists until today. And during this conference, if you... Uh, oops. Uh, it was a gigantic conference we organized, and it was a very particular moment in history in Brazil. That was 2009. Um, the software was uh, much used for what we call kind of creative coders, and they were basically PhD e either professors or students in the day, presenting very serious seminars about uh, audio and audiovisual using this particular software, which is an uh, audiovisual language a visual programming language, and at night they were doing these crazy noisy performances. And the software, if you don't know, it's created by Miller Puckett, and this is where a little bit of the open source uh, meaning has to me. People and the community passionate about this language, they were passionate about it because there was a statement from Miller Puckett, who developer, who created this language on top of a uh, language he created that was proprietary, but he was not allowed to share with his students. And this statement, to me, start to say a lot about open source, is when you have the capability and the freedom to use in several different ways. Um, <laughs> so can you imagine how much, like me, there was a, I had just had my basically first computer and suddenly get in touch with this and have my brain exploding with all these possibilities. And this of course inspired me and it took me to do a lot of projects that connect uh, creativity and code and performance and open both softwares and hardware. And those are a few works and a few partners I had uh, cooperating during the years. Um, so I think, I truly believe that I was very lucky to be introduced to open source in that matter. It had always been about the community and the weird, weird things we can do with. By the way, when I was um, researching about what could be interesting for this conference to bring, I actually found a lot of other talks that also connect art and digital and um, software and open source software somehow. Just for uh, curiosity, does it happen to any of those uh, speakers be here today from any of those talks? Oh. <laughs> Thank you for when I talk to you later. <laughs> Unfortunately, this is um, uh, not in a language I can understand, but they are recorded and it's there for you to. Um, and I left the link when you click so you can watch them. Uh, open source also brought me to other communities, and like uh, now I live in, in Berlin, and I'm part of this very gigantic community called PyLadies Berlin. If you don't know PyLadies, we're a chapter all around uh, the world, literally, and chapters are in each country. I believe you have here in Taipei as well. And so what does it mean, I start to think about uh, what does it mean FLOSS or free and libre open source software in Brazil. Um, so for that I thought it was important for me to paint a little bit of context and this I think is the best thing I can bring to this conference is a little bit of the context we usually don't have uh, possibilities to reach out. In Brazil, um, where I come from, where I was born and raised, the, open, the free software movement, it's quite big. And this is much because of political need that we have. 
A quick, quick panorama. Um, Brazil is a very big uh, inland in geographic, continental size country that has about 280 million people living in. And it's very unequal. There's a lot of inequality, social and economical inequality. Uh, our people are very, very, very mixed, and this is uh, the result of uh, exploitive colonization, and this is how it's actually called historically. Um, we were colonized by Western European, mainly Portuguese and Italian, that, that's why we speak Portuguese. And we're a very mixed race because most of the slaves brought from Africa to Europe passed through there. And this causes a lot of uh, racial conflicts, besides of socio-economical conflicts, and the consequences is a detriment of indigenous or, or regional people, and um, that has led to a very fragile democracy in a very inequitable country. So for me, open source has indeed embedded a very political meaning and that helped me to use open source not only for the creative part, but also for uh, human rights and basically human needs, just like this project where we went in the middle of Amazon and installed uh, water, water uh, quality measurement sensors that was do-it-yourself, where we were connecting, just like I did in the creative coding part, connecting a little bit of knowledge of education, but also hands-on learning so people could uh, replicate whatever uh, we want to share. It was all about as a, a culture of sharing. Um, the open source had, has always been for me also this place that allowed me to dialogue head to head with people that are very, very different from me. So I'm a small Brazilian girl that was, has a background in arts, and yet I could join uh, the medicine school and create projects discussing um, in a linear standards with doctors or biologists in projects just like a med hacker for hacking medicine and finding ways to um, improve uh, the health of people with simple prototypes based on much of the MIT projects, and also to be able to be inside of laboratories and dealing with a genetic modified engineering, competing in iGen, for example. Um, has, has anyone here ever competed in iGen? It's a, <laughs> A very interesting competition that puts together people from humanities and engineering and uh, very, and they use like a, the engineering process to biology. Um, it also helped me put all of this together and make people trying to speak the same language. And language is one of the other topics that when we're thinking about open source, it's always, especially nowadays, come on top and big shout out to Coscup that is doing a tremendous and big, big work trying to have um, lots of languages here, trying to communicate while you're respecting um, native languages or more regional or dialects or languages. And this was another uh, project that connected me to Mexico City, which is the next place we're traveling from here. Um, and this is when I start learning that open source can have many definitions. While in arts, I could use for a creative purpose, and for me, it was all about politics and uh, necessity of political necessity. I learned that um, when I talk to a biologist or an architect or a pharmaceutical or a doctor, that can mean something different. And um, creating a common language was most of the work I did in this project, which was my, my master uh, degree putting people to prototype uh, augmented bodies with simple do-it-yourself prototypes. And this is one of the artworks slash research developed during the, the laboratory where we could um, sum up all of our knowledge to create something different or something that we could not imagine just by ourselves. Um, but it's quite important to mention that the context in 
not only the geography, but also in the time frame matters a lot and changes a lot. I'm, I'm not sure if this first uh, event that introduced me to open source could actually happen in, today. Um, that because uh, that was an important byproduct of a very specific moment in digital culture in Brazil, where we have a very cool minister of culture who supported and funded these kinds of projects. And uh, Brazil was a blooming economy at the time, which unfortunately is not today. While back then, uh, Hungary was not in the map anymore, today unfortunately it is. So the emergency changes the context. And if today um, my basically human needs is uh, eating, or is like having some projects in Mexico, very famous in open source, like a finding water, that emergency changes the whole context and what is produced in open source. So that led me to Mexico. And in Mexico, that whole understanding of, um, um, it was super different. So in Brazil, we had this original people in a very warm country, and lots of what we built was made in foliage and very ephemeral material. So when the Western Europeans come, um, they don't see the vestiges, they don't see what is there that is not material, even more. It was about oral culture. In Mexico, um, they had the Mayas and Aztecas and these big, big constructions. So when the Spanish come to colonize the country, there was a very brutal, but there was a, a, a big, big fight put it in. Because there was a, a lot of material culture already installed in the country. And <laughs> what does it have to do with open source? Because from Mexico, what I learned there is I could not put all my um, learnings and what I, and open source was not the same there. And I, I believe that has to do a lot with this culture and this context. Um, for Mexico, open source was just one more way of self-organized communities, because that has come since uh, pre-Mesoamerican time, as it is called historically. And um, they had already, they are still up today, the original people, uh, references in self-organized communities. And many open source projects will be embedded on that. Um, one of them, the most famous, is the Zapachistas. Not sure if any of you have heard about it. I'll take it as a note. They're a very cool self-organized community, autonomous community. <laughs> Um, but it was very interesting because at this time, it was about 2016, and this is the time frame, it was also the blooming of the startup culture. So Silicon Valley had this narrative put into the world um, that was saying, that was um, privileging the idea of the male genius, the young male genius, who got billionaire from night to day with a, just a cool project that it was open source. That idea was spread around, and when we did a hackathon in Mexico, it was quite different the context, because there was less this idea of the necessity of a political need of data transparency, or fighting against corruption, for example, and it was exchange for um, this idea of the, how can I improve my perspective, my individual perspective as a developer with some lines of code that I can copy paste and then become a millionaire. And um, here I'm like a totally not, it's not a judgment, but just understanding how it did change when I saw very young people leaving the university and when they are, were proposing to work together, collaborative, that changed a lot the products that were uh, being created there. And a very important thing to say is that when you have this context, the free and libre open source software philosophy has been almost forgotten. And, um, oops. <laughs> um, one thing that I learned in Mexico is that, well, there was a little note about language that I have already commented. Um, that the language we are nowadays, we, and I saw a lot of this conflict in Mexico, we use English as most of the uh, documentation we use for open source projects. Um, but we have seen a lot of projects that, a lot of people in certain regions that 
we cannot reach people because they are not obliged to speak a second language. Most of um, the people around the world do not have this language as this first language. So that means that for you to be involved in open source, you have to first have a first barrier or having access to this particular language. This is why, big shout out to Coscup that maintains most um, of um, its uh, schedule in, um, is it Mandarin, the most of it, or? Big shout out to that. <laughs> we need more languages in open source. It also taught me the importance of documentation. The documentation. When I do this parallel in between society's culture and open source, um, to me is a way to understand more broadly what we, when we talk about open source. If the Mexican people can still have a lot of documentation because they have some materiality, for me, I pass this knowledge to open source as well. Um, and so many of the projects I've done, just like those that I show you one picture, is because I probably have one or two pictures. Most of it has not been documented. They could be the coolest projects, but they have not been documented at all. And this is all lost knowledge. And when we want to analyze or understand open source during the last 25 years, there's just a few left. So here is a question for you. <laughs> Who here has an open source project and keeps an updated wiki? with information of the project. <laughs> we have heads. Uh, who here adds a roadmap to the project? We also have hands if you're seeing this recorded. Um, who records the meeting where the discussions happen so others in other time zones can follow? We also have hands. And uh, who keeps a semantic version? <laughs> it's very spreaded, I believe. Like some hands are for one or another. And then who keeps uh, documentation in more than one language? This is all part of documenting and material process and open source. And this is why I bring it up. This is um, all the knowledge that in 25 years we learn it is important. And when we talk about diversity, inclusion, onboarding people, all this comes from this perspective of how important it is to leave for the people or investigators or contributors of tomorrow a little bit of those ruins, a little bit of vestiges um, that we plant today. And talking about, um, I think it's important to also bring this knowledge about this difference in between floss and open source. Who here really knows the difference or have ever heard about uh, floss and open source? You? For the people who haven't known about it, um, the, what we call now more commonly open source started, well, um, uh, properly started in 85 when a gentleman called uh, Richard Stallman founded the Free Software Foundation with this idea, a very political meaning of free or libre software, so free no, not as no money, but free as protecting the freedom. And this is being uh, brought up with a lot of strength nowadays for a lot of uh, uh, either far right uh, movements or the invasion of privacy after um, social networks uh, uh, infringements. And so this politics of the free or the freedom that all the users and everyone should have, it is returning with a lot of strength. There's a lot of gossip, and if you search a little bit, you see a lot of a very juicy gossips between both movements kind of fighting to each other. It is not like this nowadays. Both open source, which comes started in 98 with the foundation of the open source initiative, it kind of takes off the philosophical or the concept of the, the free software movement implant, and it focuses in the practical side. This is why the people from the free software movement start to get a little 
you cannot take the politics behind, right? You take all the meaning out. But that allowed the business to get in and the idea of being very practical and facilitate the collaboration and others to on board, much easier. It take all this, I mean, um, it, it, there's a reason why most of uh, this auditorium, it's not that uh, full. It's because most of people do segment the idea of society and technology, or the idea and the concepts behind of it from what we're using. And um, I believe that um, that's a mistake that has a big influence. The technology we use does influentiate how we live, but it's not very practical on a daily basis. So this is what the open source movement did. And that allowed us, for open source today, become a billionaire, a multi-billionaire uh, movement with several companies and to be the base that sustain all the software industry. And I will go on top of that, not only the software industry, but basically all the industries as we all rely on software to intermediate our lives today. Um, that was all possible because um, uh, Stallman created the idea of copyleft, or the right, the legal right for you to share your work. And there's a very cool talk uh, during the conference from a lawyer who will talk a little bit about, about that. But this is basically when you say, why was it even possible? It was because he was like a, had this kind of brilliant idea to say, I'm allowing you to use by default. And how it's been used, it has been has changed a lot um, during time, as I've been showing you a, a little bit. Um, so the free and open source movement is completing 40 years in two years now, and the open source uh, initiative is it's, it's completing 25 years this year. Um, what changed during this time was not only about, as I show you a little bit, the idea of collaboration and the power of um, the sharing has been spreaded way beyond software. It went to open knowledge, open education, open government, and many other ideas that it brings this idea of open culture. It's much, much bigger than software nowadays. Um. Oh. Oh. Was that happening before? <laughs> That's a cool timeline that the Open Source Initiative did. Um, I thought it wouldn't have internet here, so I did a little video. And this shows a little timeline of all that that I was trying to explain about what happened in the years of what we call the open culture. Um, the open source initiative um, is still a very is standard today, and they have several programs that will deal exactly with that, both with li license to still spread in the world of what open source means, uh, adv advocating for it, doing a lot of outreach, supporting a lot of projects, and mostly because we have learned a lot in the past 25 years, adding all these worries that we didn't have back then into the whole artificial intelligence that is dominating the world. So all this uh, ethical issues, diversity issue, uh, implications in society before um, AI dominates totally and do a lot of damage, they are from the beginning, which is kind of now, um, doing a lot of efforts and researches and investigations not to commit the same mistakes. And that was all because that did happen in open source. So open source to me has this a very political meaning, as I'm, well, <laughs> kind of stating. And it, it for me is very powerful because it kind of blur all these um, racial issues, so social issues, economic issues I had from Brazil, from where I was born and raised. And I lived also in Mexico. And uh, it put us into uh, this kind of anonymous, that, that, that is the idea, right? We privilege the what is going on from the who is doing it. And this should mean that everyone should be very welcome. But, and I say that because if we do not think about that collective now, we cannot fix this issue. What actually, um, when we say it's open, it's a very important as uh, Shoshana Zuboff brought on her book, um, The Age of Surveillance Capitalism. 
She brings this question that I bring to open source. It's open for who? And when we do projects, and if it is just in English and I cannot speak English, will I be inserted in this perspective? If it is an environment that I don't feel safe and I'm not joining, and yet this billion dollar industry that sustains the whole software and most of the industry nowadays, so who is developing the open source is developing the technology forward and my body cannot be there, therefore my perspective cannot be there. Who am I creating a technology to? Who will this benefit? That is the question that I believe everyone here should, uh, if there's one main takeaway, we should ask ourselves that, because that's the main learning we have in the past years. Um, and I bring that because I do a lot of the, um, advocacy for equity and inclusion, which I, I, I learned a lot in, in, in Mexico mainly, and I do a lot in Germany. Um, we still have these horrible numbers, even in Europe, where um, I'm based now, we still have uh, about tops 25% of women in tech jobs. And this is because I'm talking about diversity in a very uh, narrow perspective, about a binary gender perspective, right? I'm not talk even including other sorts. In a city like Berlin, where 30% of the population, it's not from Germany. So we do have a lot of diversity in uh, proportion. Um, women still earn less, about 18% than men, still carry much more work, especially unpaid work, and less than 5%, we do need better research on that, but um, the few research that has shows that less than 5% are women or non-binary in open source, which again is leading technology and our future on. So, um, number saved by itself. If you want to go deeper, um, there's this book. Um, it did uh, change a lot of my perspective as a developer, um, as a diversity adv adv advocate. Uh, Christina Damba Hester, she has also, if you don't want to read the book, a lot of online talks where she explain and kind of scrutinize all the work and criticize a lot of the work of, um, that I do of uh, diversity advocacy in technology. And what she does is saying, well, tech will not save the world, especially because tech sees uh, technology as a way to solve all the social issues while it's actually creating some without including the bodies that will actually this technology will affect. Um, heading to Germany, where I already started, and because I'm painting panorama from all of this world, it is still very new for me to understand the whole scenario of the free and liberty software there. But one thing that is very different for me is this idea of a real possibility of democracy. And um, it changes a lot the perspective that emergency of eating was not there anymore my basic needs um, are already supplied. So why is it open source for? That was my first question there. And what I learned is that there's another open source type that I was not paying attention, which is business, which supports and brings sustainability, including to the developers that historically has been suffering of burnouts and unpaid labor. Um, and what I learned in Germany is that there's another movement, a little bit more re recent, that it is kind of organizing um, this and making the companies who benefits most out of the work of individual voluntary and unpaid contributor to the industry. And there's a lot of departments called open source program offices um, that tried to manage that and create, bring responsibility and create a strategy for companies to give it back uh, to the communities and understand the relation of business needs and community needs. It is also something common here in Taiwan. Uh, yeah. It is a kind of new movement that is growing a lot and um, Nowadays, it is even in governments. European Union has an open source program office that try to understand how much we consume in the government that needs to go back to society, for example. 
um, to avoid exactly the tragedy of the commons that is one of the biggest mythology that open source, myth, not mythology, that open source here, that it's basically this idea that um, it comes from an essay from an ecology called Garrett Hardin, and it says that for open source, that means uh, when we all share accountability, we are prone to abdicating responsibility, assuming that someone is taking care of. <laughs> uh, that means that in open source, we consume much more than we contribute back, and this can, be, can lead to tragedies. Just like a biggest example, the SS, open SSL security breach in 2022. Um, that is one of the most common things that the industry got, ah, we, we didn't maintain, damn it. Um, so a little recap to end. Um, Technology is about context. It is about understanding a specific economical and social and geographical um, place. So for me, I understand that it is very imperative to stop separating conversations about technology and society. Um, it does take a village, and we should always include other communities, especially focusing regionalities more than just thinking about global. We cannot substitute very specific needs that should matter as much as the global scales. We should also, um, when I mentioned I started in 2009, I didn't know how to code. I copy paste stuff and do some creative things. It took me about 10 years to start contributing back to code um, as a coder. But PGCon and all this community could never happen without me. So we should find ways and maybe inclusive community to validate and de-hierarchize, to put in the same level the importance of technical and non-technical or non code contributions. Open source is about community and we should value that much more. Um, one of my ideas or proposal maybe is to have inclusion committees that should be part of every single idea and project uh, in, um, for the um, uh, Convention for Rights for People with uh, Disabilities. This statement or this slogan is nothing about us without us. It is a mistake to keep inventing new brilliant ideas that uh, software could solve without the people that we will affect being involved from the beginning, not at the end, just to have multiple choices. And lastly, we should preserve. Um, as I also learned a lot in Germany, memory is fundamental not to replicate the same mistakes. And every single documentation that you do in your project will help, not only for investigators and people interested in sociology in the future, but also for people to onboard on your project and hopefully become a contributor or the future maintainer. And for me, open source, that's my definition, is a real possibility of equity, of dehierarchization of the potential of collective organization, of flowing and belonging into a truly global world. And this is for me the beauty of open source. I have uh, tons of references if you wanna go further. And this is my uh, presentation if you would like to download it. And I thank you all very much. My second Taiwanese world that I will try to remember. Totai. No? <laughs> Thank you. So thank you, Paloma, for the interesting talk. And now we are heading to the Q&A session. So. Okay, so now we have some questions on Slido, and I would like to ask Paloma to uh, answer these questions. So the first question is the, uh, the project, I joined keep documents in English, although we're Mandarin users. We thought that using English is kind of inclusive. How do you think about this, and do you have any advice? <laughs> um, well, indeed, English, it is, um, um, I'm, as you could see, I think I, I was formed, like my background in arts means critical thinking all the time, so sometimes I'm more critical than I should. And indeed, speaking English allowed me to be here and communicating to others. So English is good. 
but I would recommend for you to add in Mandarin to your documentation. It is a lot of more work, but you will pay attention to others that would otherwise not be able to participate, and they don't have to. People should not uh, have to learn English. It is a dominating thought language. It is a structure of thinking and understanding the world and English. We cannot, it will never be the same as communicating on your native language where you have much more subtlety. So I would uh, recommend it to add another languages, and maybe not just Mandarin, indeed, as some others. Okay, so add Mandarin to your documentations. So <laughs> the next question is, um, you said create common languages between people from different disciplines. Um, eh? uh, do you mean that? Do you mean spoken language, or is that common language like a more abstract of a knowledge intersection? Yeah. Have you tried to be in a room with like a biologist, an artist, an architect, uh, um, designer, and a mathematical? It's, it's super weird because we often use uh, common stuff. Like uh, in arts, we have uh, so many specific books and references that we read. And then when we use some words, that can have uh, absolutely all the meaning. So when you're doing transdisciplinary works, um, I believe it's quite important for you to sit down and make sure you're all understanding what you're all talking about. That also goes for translating. The, our, the apps we use to translate do not hold it. They cannot deal with the subtleness of what you're actually trying to express. They're not interpreting. Um, so when I say different languages, that has both meanings, both the understanding of what you really mean and uh, the reference you carry on with the concept that can affect a lot. <laughs> <laughs> okay, thank you. And the last question on the slide is, can you share how the concept of open source can be applied in design or other non-technical fields? Uh, to me, open source is about life. Uh, it's how I take my whole life with me. It is about uh, open culture. Um, it is about a culture of sharing, um, of uh, being open to others, to have uh, their, to feel belonging, um, to being accepted and validated in their perspective, independent of the, um, the body they dress. That means uh, that it's a lot, lot to do with uh, accessibility and people with disabilities um, because they are often forgotten. And if you cannot hear, for example, and if you're only depending on audio, that would be an issue. So when I think about open culture, and I, I need to understand that I need to be able to include this other. There's another famous um, saying from Verna Myers, I believe, that inclusion, and that's to me is what open source means, is not inviting to the party, it's asking to dance. It means making people feel like they belong. That's from the open source. So it's like kind of an abstract thing? Yeah. yeah. Okay. So the, uh, we have one more question on Slido. How do you find your objective for open source at the beginning? What do you mean by that? And like, how did you find your motivation, or, or how do you decide that you are going to um, give, give to this open source culture? Oh, open source is a lot of work. Uh, it's not just you putting something in the open so people can see. It is making sure that how the ecosystem allows other to participate, um, and. For me, the power of collective will be always bigger than the interpretation of one. Of course, you can have your personal, private, creative moment, but when you want to do something meaningful and that affect others, that's when open source is super important. It's when you also need this other to feedback and co-create something that is way bigger than you, especially when affect others. I could say that that could be about uh, anything we put in the world. <laughs> okay, so now um, our time's time limit is coming. Thank you, Paloma, for answering these questions, and thank you for the amazing talk. And if any audience have something to talk to Paloma after this talk, welcome to find her. She'll be here. 
And thank you for listening. Thank you, Paloma, for sharing. Thank you. Thank you.